the story told of <laughs> good recording is in process. That's good to know. Uh, I always remember the story that is told of E. Stanley Jones. He was preaching in Japan. He was 88 years old. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> he was preaching three times a day. And he said, why so few? I can do five. <laughs> <laughs> so I probably could preach two times next Sunday morning and do a Sunday school class between. But it probably wouldn't be fair to you or the 11 o'clock service. Four times Sunday night. <laughs> <laughs> Only four. <laughs> if you have the handout from last week, um, and I'm sorry we don't have more of those if, if you're new. <clears throat> we had looked at chapter uh, at question six. Where is humanity in the process, and what does this suggest? Humanity is at the apex. There's a real sense in which chapter one is a triangle. And humanity is at the very top. And as we said last week, it's one of the three instances in the chapter where creation is mentioned. God created them. He created man in his own image, as verse 27 says. So this says to us, that humanity is not an afterthought in the creative process. Humanity is indeed the goal. Now, it's often said by critics, well, what a, what a human-centered idea that is. Yeah, it is. And it is astonishing, again, as I said last week, in that, in all the rest of the origin accounts in the rest of the world, humanity is an afterthought. Now again, if you think about the world and you say, okay, what is ultimate reality like? Well, it must be like this. Well, on that basis, we're not very important. What little place do we take? I was interested some years ago, the largest biomass on this planet is earthworms. <laughs> you want to go by biomass, it's worms that are the most important thing in the world. So this is not something that you're going to derive from trying to look at the world and then imagine what reality is about. This is revelation. This is the creator saying, you know why I did this? I, this is for you. And again, the, the cosmologists who are daring to believe point out to us that 40 things had to happen in the first one-tenth of a second after the Big Bang for humanity to exist. <laughs> If any one of those things had not happened, we wouldn't be here. Interestingly, one of the reasons we're here is because of all the planets, ours is cockeyed. Ours is 23 degrees off center. And because of that, life exists here. Wow. Who thought of that? Yeah, yeah. God says, zap, let's get the moon out of there and shield it over. <laughs> so we'll want to talk more about this. We'll talk more about it in relation to chapter two. But the whole question is, why is humanity so important to God? Why has God made this creation for us? And the interesting thing is, is there sentient life somewhere else in the universe? Maybe, but it's fascinating how hard it is to find it. Here we are, so far alone. Wow. What in the world is that about? Now, where does sexual differentiation 
appear in this chapter. Verse 27, male and female made he them. Now we can infer it, they reproduce according to their kind, but there's nothing stated about sexual differentiation till we get to humans. Wow. Again, this is astonishing in the comparison with the other origin accounts. And, and again, remember, there are no other creation accounts making something brand new that never existed before. All of the others are based on the idea matter has always existed. And what happened is the gods emerged by sexual process from the chaos and they organized the chaos. They didn't create it. This one alone says, God did something brand new that never existed before. Wow. So again, what's the significance of that? Why is creation not sexually produced? In all the others, it is. The gods appear as a result of sexual process. The gods are sexually differentiated. The gods produce the world by sex. Why not this one? God is completely other. God is completely other. God is not sexed. Now I want to say it again. I, I think we've got to be very careful. God is not a male. God is all that femininity is, and he is all that masculinity is. He comprehends it all in himself. Well, next question. Why is God referred to in male language then? Why don't we call God... I mean, obviously, if you refer to God like that, you are a male chauvinist. <laughs> You're trying to make God a man. Well, that's not an alternative. That's a monstrosity. <laughs> Well, all right, let's call God. What's the matter with that? He's a person. He is not a person. And this is, I've said this before, I'll say it again. Remember about repetition. Uh, what is unique about the Bible is it has the idea of the transcendent one a being that is absolutely other than the world. Well, the Greeks imagined this. They tried to think about it. They didn't succeed. But the Bible not only says he is transcendent, but he is a person. And the Greeks said, that's not possible. A person is influenced by other persons. The transcendent one can't be influenced. And the Hebrews say, yeah, we know, but that's the way it is. <laughs> there is what is genuinely, absolutely unique to the Bible. All right. So why this male reference? to a being that's not sexed? Well, the answer is because of the alternative. <clears throat> Where did you come from? Where did I come from? I emerged from my mother's body.
What's wrong with that as regards God? He's transcendent, so he would... You lose transcendence. You cannot maintain transcendence with feminine deity. Right across the world. Right across the world. Yes. And again, I, I hope uh, you catch my theme here. What is paganism? Paganism is looking at this creation and saying invisible reality must be like this. We all emerge from a sexual process and emerge from a female body. So we all emerge from the body of a female deity. No. No. And that's the issue. You've got to choose, if you're going to talk about a person, you've got to choose he or she. And unfortunately, because of its implications, not because there's any problem with femininity, but because of its implications, that one is not a possibility. Jared? Um, I'm not too serious, but asking the question, why not refer to him as they, uh, <laughs> as three persons? Um, because of the immediate association with polytheism. Okay, yeah. And That's what exactly what the Muslims say about us. You believe in three gods. That's where the problem is. Okay, but Elohim is plural. Oh yeah. So uh, but the but the pronouns with it are always singular. Right. Again, it, it's fun to think about that. Why do they use a plural name and singular pronouns? <laughs> and as I said last time, I'm convinced it's because he is all the gods in himself is everything that we've differentiated for all these others. Joe. I, I apologize. I am I am not catching at all what you're saying about why it can't be she. Good for you. I, I, Good for you. I'm just, it doesn't make any, it's not making sense to me. So there's something that you're, okay. that's obviously okay. it's easier to think of than what I'm <clears throat> comprehending here. We did not emerge from God's body. God spoke us into existence as beings who are like him, but separate from him. So, I am my mother. So why does that have anything to do with pronouns? I mean, what, I, I'm, so she implies that uh -huh. one has to be... Yes, yes. As soon, in person. the ancient world, as soon as you use she... You are, number one, implying sexuality. And number two, that we have emerged from the gods. Even if, it, even if it's not in the Genesis account, everyone around them would still make that assumption when they heard Judaism explained to them. Even if it wasn't in Genesis 1 that we came out of the... God's body, everyone around them would assume that. Because, oh, yeah, of course, that's what happened. Well, they have to do a book deal, too, because we know that God came to earth in the form of a man. Or you could take that the other way. <laughs> Why did he come to earth in the form of a man? Because <laughs> he did not produce the world sexually. I, I think it can it can go both ways. It goes back full circle to say he is complete in himself. Yeah. The female doesn't produce without the seed from the male. Yeah. So you get back to this yeah. the same thing. He can speak it into being without yes, anybody yes. else. Without any sexual activity, without any birth. Is there any issue here between God creating Adam and then from Adam creating Eve? I don't think so. We'll talk about that in chapter two, but I've always loved that. <clears throat> Light, good. See, good. Male, it's not good. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> so I, I, I have to say that in his mind from the beginning, humans were sexually differentiated, male and female. Now, I think he did that for theological reasons. Uh, it, uh, <laughs> forgive me, I, I'm hopelessly out of date here. We are not interchangeable. <laughs> is it i lord yes <laughs> we're not interchangeable males and females are not interchangeable physically it's obvious but it's true psychologically as well i need karen i am incomplete without her and she's not here to fight for herself, but I dare to say she's not complete without me either. We are made for each other. We are made to find ourselves in another. And our whole society says, no, no, no. I am complete in myself. I need nothing else. I need nobody else. I am me and I am all. And God is trying to say in the way he made us, that's not true. You need something else. You need someone else. And not just her, but me. Okay. So, again, this is terribly significant. God did not create using sexual processes. Here's another way of saying it. Sexuality, excuse me, sexual differentiation is not part of eternal reality. That's why Jesus said, there's not going to be marriage in heaven. Now, I don't know how that's going to work. <laughs> I've said before, if I get to heaven and I'm not married to Karen, there's going to be a big stink. <laughs> <laughs> But somehow or other, sexual differentiation is not part of eternal reality. It's part of creation. God made us this way. And, and I think, and, and this may be a stretch, but I think the fact that it's not referred to until you get to humans is a way of saying human sexuality is different from animal sexuality. Mm -hmm. Now, again, I don't want to get too explicit here, but if you've been raised on the farm, you know that. The sexuality of a couple of cows is not the same as ours. How does the expression, no man is an island, fit in with this? Yeah, the, the poem, uh, no man is an island entire of himself, we are all part of a continent that is being eroded away. Uh, I, I think he, he there is thinking we're part of society. I think, I think that poem is, is dealing with that. Yes, Darren. Uh, I think uh, to strengthen your point on heaven in Revelation, we are the bride. We yeah. are the bride. Uh, all of us. Yep. As one. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Chapter two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I'd like to hold that off and talk about it, uh, because it's, it's related to the two different functions of the two chapters. Uh, the, the first question I'm going to raise on the, on the second, why two stories? And we need to talk about that. But I think, I think the function of chapter two is different from the function of chapter one. And I'd like you to think about that in the next two weeks, uh, assuming we don't get there today. Uh, uh, What's chapter one for, and what's chapter two for? They're not the same. Okay. 
He created man in his own image. <laughs> now, if all the trees that have been cut down to make paper, to write books on this subject, the earth would be covered with trees. <clears throat> what is the image of God? And, and notice how I stated the question here. What do we mean when we say she's the spitting image of her mother? What do we mean? She looks, like she looks just like her mother. Is that all? She acts like her mother. <laughs> yes. She said, I will never in my life say that and finds herself at age 45 saying what her mother said. If, if she is an image of her reference from which she comes, then she incarnates to some degree <clears throat> from which she comes without even knowing it, saying it, or anything. Yeah, yeah. She she embodies her mother. So what does it mean for you and me to be in the image of God? Be a person. <laughs> to be a person? Mm-hmm. He is a person, and we are persons. And, yes. and uh, those of you who remember Dr. Kinlaw know that he loved to talk about this. But yes, we are persons. Which also means that we're made to be in relationship. We are made to be in relationship as the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are in relationship. What else? We, and I'm going to say it, we share his characteristics. Have a spiritual dimension. Okay. Is the triune nature of God and the triune, you know, man has body, soul, and spirit, is that also an aspect of God? Or it could well be, could well be. Rational and have a moral nature. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we are the image of God. <laughs> Now, this is, again, pretty shocking in the ancient world. What is an idol? God says throughout the Old Testament, almost every chapter, don't you dare do that. <clears throat> Someone said an idol is an eye doll. <laughs> <laughs> an eye doll, yes. Yes. God is me written large. Forgive the bad grammar. The gods are gooder than we are, but they are also better than we are. They are truer than we are, but they're also falser than we are. Uh, that's not a word either, I don't think. But anyway, and you can go down that list. They are stronger than we are. They're weaker than we are. They're smarter than we are. They're stupider than we are. They are everything we are. So the direction here is and again, 
It's, it's like the whole Bible. Well, it's so similar. I mean, I mean, we're the image. He's the image. Uh-huh. And two people doing the same thing are not necessarily doing the same thing. Rape and conjugal sex are not the same thing. Now, there's another thing here, of course. Who is the image of God? Jesus. Jesus. You want to see what God looks like? Take a picture of Jesus. He is the image <laughs> of the invisible God, says Paul. Mm -hmm. How does the uh, Septuagint Trans, do they use the same word icon in, in as yep. Colossians? Yep. Do they mean the same thing? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> but there it is. A again, a an incredibly simple and yet amazingly profound statement. You are the image of God. God is not the image of you, thank the Lord. You are the image of God. And this, of course, is the old line, the only Jesus most people will ever see is you. Oops. <laughs> Oops. statement about Jesus and that he could use a human body to represent God. Exactly. 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 Yes. Yes. And I, you, you wonder about all the implications of that. You know, the Bible says he suffered everything we suffer, but without sin. Did he have a cold? I guess so. Pardon? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. and not swear <laughs> yes 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 you almost flash out at somebody but then stop himself and have to <laughs> we don't know but we do know he was God in the flesh he had anger Oh, yes. He, he hated sin. And yes, he, yes. When he saw... People, yes, oh, yes. Yeah, when he ran those people out of the temple with a quip of cords, he didn't think he wasn't gentle Jesus, meek and mild. <laughs> they thought he was mad. <laughs> they were right. Yes, the issue is we tend to get mad over injuries to ourselves. Jesus got mad over injuries to others. Don't. And what occurred to me is you're talking about image and being made in the image of God is just, in my idea, is the concept of a photograph. You know, it's yeah. we, we are created from that picture, but that picture is a representation of a much larger, more profound being. And so oh, yeah. you can't take what was made in the image of that picture and then recreate that picture again, you know, yeah. or the, the, the being that we were. Born. Yeah, that flat surface is there. Yeah. yeah. And so yeah. it's there's a two dimensionality kind mm -hmm. of thing to, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. that. And so yeah. that's where I feel like that backwards you were talking about yeah. can't work because it's it's an image. It's, <clears throat> it's not yeah. the being. There is, now, yes, there's an aspect of this, I think, of this being created in the image of God that we ought to highlight. Um, Jesus is the image of God, and he came as a servant yeah. to serve. Yeah. So we who bear his image are to serve others who bear his image. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's part of being in, mm -hmm. in the image of God. Mm -hmm. I came not to be served but to serve. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. I mean, the thing is bottomless. <laughs> you can, you can reflect on that theme virtually forever because it's the image of God. 
But yes, who is God? What did he do? How did he act? How does he act? How has he acted in Jesus? That's the image. Yeah. And you know, John, I think uh, reading your one of your books yesterday, you mentioned that we in the Western world don't actually make idols, figurines that we worship. But what we desire, our love more than God, is an idol. Yes. We we excuse ourselves too quickly because oh, we, we, absolutely. Think we don't have anything in our house that we look up to and worship like a Buddha. But we can make an idol of things. And this is why, you know, when you hear Christian testimonies, mm -hmm. again and again and again, you will hear people saying, God asked for this in my life. And I didn't want to give it to him. An idol. Something that I love more than God. And you know, God says, may I have it? And it may be the littlest thing in the world. But there it stands. And God says, may I have that? No. <laughs> no. You can't have my golf clubs. <laughs> the story that I've loved, and it's not original with me, but the old farmer says, I never knew that two coon dogs and a shotgun were bigger than God until he asked for them. <laughs> Like Joe's idea of a picture. Yeah. Because if you looked at a picture of something from your past that is meaningful, yeah. you get the same feelings. You you, you relive that yeah. situation. Mm -hmm. So there's meaning there. There's yeah. depth. There's there's a relationship. It represents a relationship with the past that you don't get. And it's interesting that if if you know if we are pictures of God. There's a bit of an echo to it, right? There's there's some there's some distance there, but there's also you wouldn't have the echo if you didn't have the original sound. So it yes. And this in my mind is an example of inspiration. I, I've used this don't exaggerate a million times. <laughs> uh, how do I know the Bible is inspired? Because a five year old who can read can get the essential point, but there is no bottom to it. Image of God. Yeah, I'm a picture of God. That's that. <laughs> oh, and what does that mean? <laughs> the, the marvelous simplicity of what is said and the endless implications of it. Sir? Yes. I, I think of myself, I'm a father yep with kids and i have also been a coach and when i teach an event long jump triple jump high jump shot foot distance whatever um i have to teach different techniques sometimes for different uh strengths and weaknesses that that athlete has and we all do that with our children also and sometimes we might misinterpret things, <laughs> but but it's a real challenge uh, how we we how we do that with yes. others. Yes. Prayer. Yes. 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 Okay. Verse twenty-eight. First four words. God blessed them. What does that mean? And why did God do it? What do we do when we bless somebody? You favor them. Pardon? You favor them. You favor Put them? them? Mm -hmm. Put them in a favored position. You make them happy. You make them happy? Yeah. God bless you. Okay. You gift them. You give them a gift. You gift them. Yes, I want to give you the good things of life. You wish for the best in the future for them. 
Why is that important and what's it doing here? <clears throat> Giving them a mission, yeah. And a good mission, huh? Giving them his love. Giving them his love? Giving them self-confidence. Giving them self-confidence. Mm -hmm. They can do these things. But... Mm -hmm. Looking forward to the future. They have no history to speak of. <laughs> no history. <laughs> Sometimes to bless someone means to make them holy. To make them holy? To bless them? The default is blessing, not cursing, as we see in the Genesis 3. What did Janet say? The default is blessing and not cursing, as we see in Genesis 3. Okay, yes, that's going to be significant as we go on. What do you do when you curse someone? Wish them harm? You make them little. Little. Make them Less. little? Okay, that's, that's enough on that, because we want to talk more about it. But so what's it doing here? In a sense, this is the climax of the process. He created them male and female. In his own image, he created them, and he blessed them. Is there an aspect of prosperity there? I think so. He's prospered them. He's making them fruitful. Yes. He's telling them to be fruitful. Yes. So he's yes. equipping them to be so. The, the word that's often used these days is flourishing. For you want some? Pardon. For a purpose. For a purpose, yes, yes. Isn't it like he's, he's sending them forward with, with him? It's an ordination. Absolutely. An ordination? Mm -hmm. Commissioning. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but he doesn't say, and he directed them. Uh, it, is, it is, hey, I did all this for your enjoyment. I did all this for your prospering. I did all this that you might flourish. Hmm. Not, I did all this so that you could serve me. Verse 22, it talks about God, then God blessed, at least in my mind. Uh, then God blessed them, be fruitful and multiply the fishes and the birds. Is, is, is that the same? Yeah, yeah, it is. Verse 22, God blessed them, saying, be fruitful and multiply. And that, that's, a good, that's a good point. Because he's going to say the same thing to humans later. Right. Yeah. Have lots of kids. Empowered them. Empowering. Yeah. And then he affirmed them. Yeah. What all this says to us, I think, is God's intentions for us and for creation. It's for good. And I think... For many of us who were raised in, in good Christian homes, we don't really believe that down here. We really see him as king who made us for a purpose. And we often miss that purpose. That's why he's called the father. <laughs> exactly and not king now is he a king of course he is but he's a fatherly king now this is all you you guys get a uh, preview i'm going to preach on the sermon on the mount next week our father in heaven our father in heaven hmm hmm No, he's not the gimlet-eyed monarch whom we can never quite satisfy. He's our father. 
who's hoping the very best for us. Now, has sin entered and messed this picture up? Yes, tragically so. But this is the starting point. This is God's goal. This is God's aim. He wants to bless you. He wants to bless me. And if there's any way in the world he can do it, he's going to do it. I'm impressed with you know, how much, how relational he is. I know that, you know, over the years, um, that is something that has sort of gotten, at least in my experience, you get lip service to that. Well, God wants a relationship with us. But just how much of an emphasis that really just from the beginning that was is that it was all about he's all about a relationship. Um, you know, one of the proofs of Christ's deity is the fact that if God is love, he has to have an object. Yeah, he's been uh, yep. love from all eternity, he's yep. had to have an object from all eternity. Yep. So it sort of points to the Trinity. So it's it's it, he's relational from eternity. Yes. And it's just, I'm impressed with, you know, the more we study all those. Uh, just... And that's, that's a Kinlaw truism. Before he was creator, he was father. Yeah. yeah. So those, those four words. Hmm. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, over every living thing. And God said, behold, I've given you every plant yielding seed that's on the face of all the earth. Every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. Why did God make us? This isn't the total answer, but this is part of the answer here. Why did he make us? To have fellowship with him. For himself. For himself and to enjoy his world. Not to carve our initials in it. This is often, it's often said by environmentalists, well, this verse is the problem. Have dominion over it and subdue it. Hmm. The idea, again, throughout the Old Testament, and this would be especially true for that situation, is nature is dangerous in its original state. <laughs> and what you need to do is to cultivate it. Bring order. Pardon? Bring order. Bring order to it. Yes. Yeah. And the whole idea... <laughs> Something wrong? <laughs> Someone needs to mute their computer. In the biblical understanding of to have dominion over, it is to improve, to care for, to develop. Pardon? To name. To name, <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, and it's in that sense that God says, hey, I've made this world for you. Again, what a stunning idea in the context of the ancient literature. I've made this world for you. It is not your enemy. When he originally made it, it didn't need to be claimed. <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know about that. I I I think it might have been. I, I don't know. It's it's a question of to what extent is wilderness the result of sin. Uh, uh, but there it is. It's it's for us and for us to care for. Um So what can we say about God from this much of the chapter? Now, actually, chapter 2, verses 1 and 3 go with this, and we haven't gotten there yet. We will in two weeks. But uh, what can we say about God from this passage? He's 
intention. Okay. Is intentional. Well, in your lap here. <laughs> He's all powerful. What else? He's very creative. Yeah. Yeah. He's creative. Benevolent. Relational. Orderly. Wise. <laughs> Good. I'm working hard to get all those in my own life. The tough thing. Not all he is there, he is aware, and he cares. <laughs> Uh huh. Uh huh. This is not so obvious, but he is a person. Okay. <laughs> It's a peso. He can spell too. <laughs> In that he cares about what he's made. I I mean by that. He says, light. Ah, that's good. That's good. He's not part of creation. He's not part of creation. He is a person who is separate from it. And, and I've always loved, what does good mean? And, mm -hmm. and I learned this from Robert Trina at the seminary a long, long time ago. It doesn't mean light is moral. What does it mean? It means it exactly fits what the artist imagined. The artist looks at a painting and says, ah, that's good. In other words, yes, it represents the image I had in my mind. The universe that God made is good. It's what he planned. And as a person, he can reflect on that because it's not part of him. Okay, our time's up. Uh, somebody will be teaching you next Sunday. <laughs> we live in faith. <laughs> and I'll be back in two weeks. In the meantime, and I love this story. I've told it to many of you. As the little boy was being carried out of the church service by his father, he was heard to say, y'all pray for me now. <laughs>